Ond mae'n bleser gen i gymryd yr awenau rwan i gyflwyno'r sesiwn nesaf i chi heddiw yn y gynhadledd. Fel dych chi wedi darllen yn barod yn siŵr yn yr rhaglen, mae profiad y siaradwyr nesaf yma o weithio yn y sector bwyd ac ameth yn un helaeth. Mae Jonathan Burney yn cydnabod fod cwblhau ysgoloriaeth nyffil nôl yn 2015 wedi bod yn gatal ei ddallweddol yn ei benderfyniad o'i sefydlu i gwmni yn gynghorol i hunan nôl yn 2017. Canolbwyntio ddi ymchwil nyffil do ar ddulliau ar arwen newid o fewn y diwydiant ameth, felly yn naturiol roedd o'n enw amlwg i ni um, i gyd fynd efo'r thema uh, y gynhadledd yma heddiw. So, Jonathan, I'm really pleased to welcome you back to Wales once again. And I, like the majority of the audience here, I'm sure, I'm looking forward to hearing, your, uh, hearing you share your, your very optimistic vision for the future of Welsh agriculture. Really looking forward to what you've got to say. So, allwn ni greu Jonathan Burney i'r llwyfan os gwelwch yn dda. Very good. Well, it, it's been inspirational so far this morning, hasn't it? It, it? it was very interesting watching watching Chris and then Lloyd, and I heard Lloyd sort of say, well, kind of, how do you follow that? How do you inspire? But I, I'm just saying, people are inspirational in different ways, and I love listening to Chris, and I love listening to, to Lloyd and Daphne there, um, and it's almost, this is the attitude, and then this is what you can do when you apply it, and and it's, it's really exciting, and so what we're going to do over the next bit, I'm going to sort of skip through some of my slides because they're, they're nearly scene setters, and then we're going to get down to some, I think, practical things that might help you to deliver into the future and take hold of what I think probably is going to be a golden age of agriculture over the next um, number of years. Um, so we'll go from there, but we're just going to start oh, with this here. Just quick agenda. I'm going to say there's, there's a danger to begin with in what I'm doing here at the start. Now, I don't know why there's... If somebody can sort the other one on the left as well, that would be great. But uh, on, on this side here, anyway, there's a danger in actually starting with supply and demand and, and what essentially the market's going to do, because you get back to almost that victim mentality again um, that Chris was talking about earlier on. I'm waiting for somebody else to save me. Well, the news is this here, and, and I apologise if I offend, but nobody's out here to save you. If you're not prepared to do it, tough luck, you're gone shortly. Um, and that's just the way of it. And, and by the way, I don't mind annoying anybody, by the way. So <laughs> I don't live here, I can leave. Um, so <laughs> just to be very clear. So what I'm trying to do when I talk about the market is to show you that there are considerable reasons for optimism. It's going to be up and down, but the trend looks good. And, and the demand looks good, and it's exciting. But the really key part is this here, and I think that has come across incredibly clearly from the previous two speakers, is that unless you grab it, it isn't going to happen. Unless you do it, it's not going to happen. And that's very much about your mindset, and then very much about your actions. So the first few slides, I'm going to whip through them very quickly, and then after that we will get on to perhaps some of the delivery points. So what does a golden age look like? And really in agriculture, to my mind, it's very cl clearly... It's, it's all around mainly food production. There are other things, but, but we're talking food here predominantly. High demand for food, significant market development, recognition of the importance of agriculture that, that, that you matter and what you're doing is good. And I thought it was really interesting, Chris, talking about purpose um, in life. And there are a number of purposes, but one of the purposes is this with your job. Your job is actually about making somebody else's life better. And if that's one of your aims, it's quite fundamental and it's really important. And you do do that in farming. Well, most farmers do it, actually, to be fair. The one you were talking about earlier on, Daphne, about actually, you want, that's the guy you want to actually buy that farm. The, the, that farm actually probably isn't making somebody's life better, but you get the idea. Um, but look, the other aspect that comes in is the whole aspect of transformational technology. Technology makes a difference. People are very sceptical at times. Particularly in Northern Ireland, we like to be cynical. We're proud of it. I'm not entirely sure why, but we're proud of the Titanic as well, but there you go. Um, so, uh, um, yeah. so uh, the other thing is growing businesses. What that does mean is other businesses do go out of business as well. A business that, that, that grows, generally speaking, over time, takes over other businesses, and that's what's going to happen. So it's not all good news for everybody. It's not unrelenting optimism today. I hope to leave you with a little bit of misery as well. But you need to get that to motivate you sometimes. And the last one really is this. The UK used to lead the world in agricultural productivity. It doesn't at the minute. But actually we have the technical skills and the farmers to do it. And we have the technology and we have so much advantage here in the UK that we don't have elsewhere. 
And, and, and I'm going to try and encourage you to take um, really control of that as you go forward. Um, the other thing that's just worth bearing in mind is if you don't think your, your, your job's important, um, actually, if we don't have food, we're going to have wars. And I prefer to eat food, to be absolutely honest with you. But that is absolutely fundamentally true. Um, global peace is dependent on food and water security. Um, and it's really, really important that we take note of that in particular. So just to very quickly give you a little bit of a vision of agriculture, this is, you know, vision is just dreaming. What could the future be? It doesn't involve recreational drugs. It can do, but that's not normally accurate. Um, but really sort of throwing, throwing this up, what should farming look like in, in 25 or 30 years? And really, to my mind, um, you're coming up with things like world-leading productivity. It's going to be the best industry in the world. You're coming up with farmers having holidays. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of those holidays. It means you take time off. You get time to think. You get time to develop your business. You, you move on sort of from that to being really customer focused. Um, um, apologies for having to turn because it's not actually showing any of these figures on the screen here. But um, farming is a career choice. Have any of you ever thought of that? Actually, so many people complain about farming, but actually it's a great job. And if done properly, it's a really good career choice if you're suited to it. If you're not, do something else, obviously. Um, but it's also going to be information rich. It's going to be very connected to the consumer. It should be profitable in the long run. And again, I was encouraged to see Lloyd putting up figures and things there again. It was, it's really good to see people showing profit. Profit's a good thing. Lots of farmers in Northern Ireland don't like paying tax. But here's the thing. Um, if you make tax, you've made some money. It's a great job. I like it. Um, but the, the really key things that we want to do with farming are to make it profitable, sustainable, and enjoyable. If it's a constant misery, you shouldn't be doing it. It's as simple as that there. And as somebody said, once said to me, there are people who bring joy you know, when they enter the room and others who leave, bring joy when they leave the room. And, <laughs> and which one are you? So quickly moving on um, to this here. You, you've kind of heard of Brexit, I imagine. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about it. I just had to put it up there to annoy everybody. Um, but... <laughs> um, yeah. Ever seen anything so depressing in your life? I was in Westminster on the day of the vote, and flip, if you want to see a few nutcases, um, I'll tell you it was an interesting spot to be. Um, but look, there's a couple of points I want to draw out. I'm not going to go through this in, 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 in major detail, um, but two, two industries that are not supported by subsidy. Just to throw out there that actually there's an awful lot of potential. New Zealand was in a financial crisis in 1984. They, they basically, um, overnight, a parliament that was actually half composed of farmers actually voted to stop subsidies. Um, and it caused a lot of um, angst. But actually, if you start to look at the figures, immediately post-subsidy there, only 1% of farmers left the industry immediately. Over the next 10 years, about 8% left the industry, which was really interesting. But what came to me was that because people had a real incentive, they got business focused, they really looked at the detail. And again, that came out really clearly from what Lloyd and Daphne were doing there, just the detail, attention to detail. They now moved from having 71 million ewes producing around about 390,000 tonnes of, of, of lamb meat to the point now which there's 26 million ewes producing 420,000 tonnes. And broadly speaking, they are profitable. But they are highly business focused. And, and I've spent a lot of time in New Zealand. And the one thing I would say is, are their best farmers better than here? Absolutely not. But um, is, there a, is, is there a shorter tail? Is the average farmer much more business focused? Completely. And that's one of the things that we have to learn and, 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 and really grab. Also going to move on to actually one of the, the success stories of Northern Ireland agriculture, which is the pig industry there. We have an average age of about 37 or 38 for the pig farmers in Northern Ireland. It's the third most efficient pig industry in the world, just behind Holland, quite a wee bit behind the Dutch yet, or behind the, the Danish at the minute. But we had a real absolute disaster um, where about 50% of uh, farmers left the industry um, almost overnight following a, a major fire. So inside three or four months, we lost um, nearly half the production. Um, bad in the short term, in the long term, is very good because it actually let those who were really committed and interested and business focused move on. And simply by using data, by engaging with, with, with specialists who, who bring technology to the farm, um, to benchmarking, to talking, um, it made such a difference that the industry is really just running on and on. And it shouldn't be, because the feed cost is higher, the, the actual price per kilo for the, uh, for the pork is lower, and yet they're more profitable. How does that make sense? And actually it ties in again to what Lloyd was saying, actually going for margin rather than price. 
Because that's the danger in farming. It's price. It's all about price. Somebody else's fault. Um, and it's useful to have somebody to blame. Don't get me wrong. It's nice. But um, it's not always helpful. Um, so there's Brexit again. The only thing I'm really going to say about Brexit there is that actually, yes, it could be a short-term disaster uh, if, if, if we leave with no deal and all the rest of that there. But actually, in the longer term, the market will rebalance. Um, there will be markets for the food. And one of the things that we have is we are really, really close um, to a massive consumer market. That's hugely useful for us. But it also puts the weight back on again to what Daphne was talking about, but communication, but being the farm that somebody else would actually want to see opposite them. Really important. Um, we used to live beside a pig farm, and my mum always used to say that he waited until she put the washing out in the line, and then he spread the slurry. <laughs> so I'm not completely convinced that that was right. We, we don't really need to talk about these, these two things post-Brexit, post but what I will say is there will be regulation change, and actually potentially as well, a lot of things that will massively advantage our agriculture in the long run just by causing attitudinal change, causing the uptake of technology, um, and, and really just throwing it back to you to say it's, it's up to you. It's not policy. It's up to you. You do your business, and that's really, really good. So we'll, we'll keep moving on, and this is where it actually starts to get exciting. Um, if you start to look at the numbers of consumers that we have, it's incredible. Um, 1950. Um, there's some in this room that were born in that, around about 1950. I'm not going to identify them. Um, but, you know, the world was a completely different place back then. Completely. Two and a half billion. And actually, by the time we get to 100 years from then, it's, it's going to be almost four times the population. And I'm only putting that up because more people need more food. Pretty logical. Good news for the farmer. Um, as we move on from that there, you know, where are the demand drivers? Why is this going to dri drive, drive demand? And if you take some of the World Bank figures there, they reckon that people with essentially middle class people with incomes above $16,000 a year, in 2000, there's about 350, 400 million uh, um, across the world, 2.1 2 billion by 2030. That's almost immediate. And that's happening now. And I'll show you one or two graphs in a minute that says demand for food is really pushing on. And, uh, you know, that's quite encouraging. Um, and what they do comment is the number of currently low-income consumers that are lifted out of poverty is the main determinant of future global demand for food. Very important. Here's another thing then. Most of you in this room will probably be meat producers because that's kind of what Wales does, um, very similar to where I come from. But you kind of look across the world and you, you, you were sort of looking there and said, well, where do the calories actually come from? And what you actually find is that the majority is, is really from, from, from grain products and produce and, and plants. Meat is the, is the orange there, um, the dark orange, as you look at it, and it's, it's, it's actually relatively small. And what that does say is that there's a potentially much larger market there. I mean, again, if you work out China, if China ate one kilo of beef extra per year per person, just one kilo, that's the entire production of the UK gone. Not, not any surplus, everything gone. And that kind of says to me that potentially there's a decent market there somewhere if you can go find it. You know, and, and again, that's just encouraging. Um, per capita food consumption. Actually, this is really interesting because actually if you look at this here, you get to this point here. This is sort of about, about right, about right, about right, and then getting too fat, um, which is probably where, 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 where a lot of us are actually challenged because actually average calorie intake is probably going to be above what we need in 2050. And as each of these individuals actually require, as the population grows, they're actually going to eat more per capita as well. So again, the signs are excellent. The signs are very, very good. I have to stop waving my hands. I can't do it, though. Um, on to the next one here, if it's going to move. There we go. Then you start to say, well, where is the demand actually coming from? And as you look at that there, essentially the first um, three, three, three bars at the bottom there are all Asia. You have China, you have India, um, you, you, you have other Asia, and then you have Japan in the green as well. Japan's pretty static, but everything else, look at the massive increase in demand. Um, and and it's, all, it's all in Asia. But, I mean, there's, there's huge demand for, for meat products out there. Not necessarily what we would want to sell, and not necessarily at the right price yet, but it's coming. There's no question about it. Um, and I think that's quite encouraging as well. Then you, when you break it down to meat, um, you probably can't quite read that at the back, but on the left you have, you have beef, then you have sheep, then you have pork, then you have poultry, and then you have eggs. And nearly all of those products are going to increase in demand by at least a third, most of them by two thirds to almost double. And, and, and that says two things to me. Number one, we have a great market, but number two, we do have to look at the environmental sustainability. We need to look at the efficiency. And if you take, for instance, beef production at the moment in this country, where the average age of slaughter of a beef animal is around about 28 months, it's probably nine months 
too much. Nine months of feeding too much. Nine months of capital tied up. Nine months of machinery tied up. You can finish animals probably effectively at 20 months or 19 months um, than at 28 months. And you've far less input in and the same output out. So that really does raise a question about attention to detail and where you're going, um, even in terms of individual farm. And that's, again, what I loved about those two presentations. Again, there's the attitude and there's the practice um, when you put it in. It's about attention to detail, and I'll touch on that in a minute. Fish demand is going to go up as well, but there's probably not many fishermen in this room. But, um, but anyway, you never know. <laughs> um, and if you are, it's probably a hobby. You're not going to feed the world with it. So Then you get down to the production factors. And I'm going to flick through this as well, but what I am going to say is, um, and, and this again came out with Chris's talk. There's always somebody worse off than you. You think something's ch uh, farming here is challenging, and yes, it is. And, and the words drought and wheels together, I must admit, it, it doesn't go that well, does it? You know, um, ordinarily, it's not, it's not such a problem. Um, but as you go across the world, water availability is a tremendous problem, and it, it's really going to cause problems. And, you know, we, we'll talk about that in a while, but as, as temperature climbs as well, um, is a problem. Land availability, well, we need more space for cities, we need more space for living, and that actually squeezes, you know, what, what you can actually farm, because nobody's making any more of that farmland. Um, you know, so there's a, there's a bit of a challenge there. Also pests and disease. Soil loss is massive, and I'll quickly just show you one or two of those there. The only thing I'm going to, going to say there is that, for instance, in the United States, agriculture consumes 85% of the nation's pumped water, but only 12% of U.S. cropland is actually irrigated. And as temperatures rise, more of that's going to need. So where's the water coming from? Real, really, really big challenge. Um, and that, that will really cause problems in terms of overall production um, as it goes along. This is more interesting here. In terms of water stress by country, obviously red is not good. Um, and uh, well, to the time you get to 2040, you can see that middle band, uh, you know, really, really starting to struggle um, for water and therefore food production. And if you go back to what I said a minute ago about China, and Asia, you look at what's happening with Asia there. Asia is actually going to be under real stress for food production. So where's it going to come from? I mean, Europe and, and the other temperate areas are actually going to become much, much more important. And if that isn't a reason for optimism, in many senses, I don't know what is. Um, just very quickly as well, um, impact on, of climate change and agricultural yields. Uh, the, the top right square is the more interesting, but, but if you look at the UK... Uh, apparently there's no data in Ireland, but I'm assuming it's going to be very similar to the UK, uh, UK as well, but an increase in productivity of between 15 and 25% just because of climactic changes. I think it's incredible. I mean, that can be grass, it can be sale, it can be lots, but it will make us more productive. But again, we have to manage that and we have to take hold of it. It won't do it by, you know, by osmosis. You have to do it. I have to do it. And I should say, I run a small business, and, and all these challenges just apply to me as well. So I'm going to be essentially preaching in a minute to you about your attitude. It's exactly the same for me as well. It's no different. And, and the lessons I'm having to learn. This is the one thing that I did want to say, is that depending on system and crop, costs of irrigation in, in, in the States range from $16 a hectare to $268 a hectare. You go to something like um, Australia where they produce a lot of beef and you tend to think it's really cheap, but then they have, to, they have to actually haul it so far. It just puts the price and the cost of production up to similar to our own. Everybody has a stone in their shoe, but you just have to get on with it. Um, you, you deal with what you have. Soil loss is massive. This is something that is actually scary. North America and Africa lose 16 to 30 tonnes of soil per hectare per year, and it's not the bad stuff, it's like, it's like Murphy's Law, isn't it? It's not the bad stuff that blows away, it's only the good stuff, you know, and, and that's a real challenge, and when you think about really most of humanity, depending on that sort of first, you know, top six inches or top foot of soil, it's something that we genuinely need to address. It's not a massive problem in Wales, but nonetheless, it's, 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 it's an impact. So what is the UK advantage, really? The UK ability to grow grass and grain will increase. You will be more productive if you take hold of it. The soil challenges aren't as significant. The water challenge isn't. Um, and output and productivity can increase relative to our major competitors. And the other thing is this, we are beside the market as well. 70 million consumers sitting beside us. It's something that New Zealand would kill for. You know, well, that's, yeah, we hope not, but you get the idea. Um, it's, it's really important to them. The only thing I would say is this, and I do observe this, a country, an agricultural country, that is export focused tends to be more business focused. It's really interesting that. And what that tells you is it's about mentality. So if you can be close to your consumer and have that business focus, the difference is unbelievable. Um, and that. So here's the important bit now. I'm going to scare everyone now. This is the long part. Sorry about that, everyone. No, we'll be okay. Uh, <laughs> there are opportunities, okay, but you have to take hold of them. 
Opportunity one is data. We hear this big data, big data, big data. It's, big data is useless unless you do something with it, to be quite honest with you. I would start with small data. And one of the things that I will just say is, I believe that Lloyd and Daphne could not have built their farm like that without measuring. If you do not measure, you know, you're a failing farmer. Sorry if you come annoyed, but you are. It's as simple as that there. The use of data to manage, the use of data to compare, the use of data to justify management changes, and the collection of data will allow the introduction of robotics. It will allow the introduction of robotics because it will permit proper AI, and over time robotics will change livestock farming as much as it will change anything else. You will have, you will have robotics and you know, monitoring as well animal health, probably feeding animals, um, probably doing automatic soil sampling, probably out onto the hills, actually even drones going around measuring you know, health of animals and, and all that. The potential is unbelievable. And, and, and if you think I'm joking on that, um, well, bear in mind that there were lots of people that protested against Jethro Tull's you know, different inventions for actually planting crops. We don't want to automate it. We don't want, don't want to do this. Loads of people overestimate what technology is going to do initially. Oh, it's going to be wonderful. And then when it doesn't happen, people go, that's useless. And, it, and then they underestimate really what it would have done. So the first tractors that come on were probably hopeless. You know, if you think about it, and they didn't do that much, see now, would you be without a tractor? Would you be without an ATV? It's, it's just the way it goes, and you have to grab this data. What can data do for agriculture? Pretty much what it did for Tesco. Tesco's started relatively small and became the dominant force entirely because they collected data on consumers and used it to manage their business. Terry Leahy, uh, chief exec, said it's the single biggest factor that changed their business. And if it's good enough for Tesco's, it's probably good enough for me. Um, enterprises that employ, deploy analytics to obtain deep insights. Now, this, this is, this is techno-speak, but it essentially says if you use analytics to, to analyze your business and then act accordingly, it's going to transform what you do. Really, really important. And again, as Chris said, ignore most of what I say, but take one or two things home from this as to what might be the first limiting factor on your business. Opportunity two is this, learning. And we're preaching to the converted here. You're here listening to us. Um, whether you learn anything is, is, is perhaps open to some question. But the point is this here, you're trying to see what's possible. You're always learning. And there's a really interesting study by the, the, the Irish Revenue Department that actually looked at farmers who were trained and farmers who were not trained. And those that had got involved in continuous professional development or had a, had a degree, their average um, income, and that's profitability, net profit, was 12% more than farmers who didn't. And that's essentially for free. Why? Because they did things better. It's as simple as that there. And the ability to understand what effect changes could have in your business is really key. So hearing about a new practice, seeing what somebody else has done, and implementing it then um, can transform your business. So... That is the, the second one. The third opportunity for me is just this technology um, transfer. Robotics, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, quantum computing. You could, you could run on down those things. But so much of this is going to be done for you. You're going to get so much more information on how to run your business. And if you are savvy that way, you will be able to have a tremendous advantage. And you will be more internationally competitive. That's one of the depressing things, I actually have to say, about UK agriculture. You, we all tend to think that our neighbour is our competitor, and they're not. The competitor is over in Holland. The competitor is, is, is in another country flooding the world market. You can help each other to make a huge difference. Benchmarking is critical. That was the point I was making there um, about technology. A lot of people say, oh, it starts useless. You know, wouldn't that... Lots of you probably remember the, 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 the sort of ATV trikes, the ones that we all rolled through hedges, backwards hit trees with, before they worked out four wheels was better than three. Um, but, but again, you see the difference those have made, for instance, to sheep farmers in, 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 the, in the UK. Massive difference. But at the start, people were all, oh, a load of nonsense, load of, uh, what a, uh, I'll stick with my Landover. It'll get me halfway there. Um, but, y you know... That's, that's the general gist, um, and people are very sceptical about it, but those who take technology up first, yes, they make some mistakes, but actually, ultimately, they're far, far better off, and all the data shows that. So, you'll try five new technologies, three and a half or four of them will work, one won't, but don't go, ah, flip that, never worked, I'm not doing that, um, because ultimately, they change. So, that's what we're sort of saying there, um, and very interesting things, but we tend to overestimate the initial effect of technology and underestimate the long-term effect. It's, it's massive and really important. So here's we're getting down to really your own personal responsibility now. Here's some useful principles, and this has been talked about again. 
Plan, plan, plan. I like that lovely little little diagram on the side. If failing to plan is planning to fail, then haven't you succeeded? Um, it's a bit of an argument, a circular argument, um, but it's making the point that if you don't know where you're going, if you've no plan to get there, you've no idea when you've arrived and you don't actually know where you're going in the first place. So where do you want to be? What do you want to do? Whether that's a job or whether that's with your business, what are your particular skills? What are you good at? Do something you're good at, by the way. That's always a useful thing. Um, what do I need to do to get there? And how will I know when I've arrived and then need to move on to another direction? And if you don't have that written down, it's a real challenge. One of the things I had to do for the bank when I was starting a business was do a business plan. It was a good business plan, um, which I, I say that with a degree of surprise, it has to be said, and we're still exactly on it, but it's been incredibly helpful. We know what we're going to do, we knew who we were going to approach, we knew how much money we needed, and it worked very well. Um, but that was a discipline that was taught to me by somebody else, and it was very useful. See, a dream that you have, I'd love to be this here. I, I would say, I say again, Lloyd and Daphne, when you started, when you look at the difference between the, the, the little farm you bought and what you have now, you probably to a degree had to visualise it, but you maybe didn't visualise it like that. But if you didn't have some idea of where you wanted to get to and how to do it, it wasn't going to happen. So a dream written down becomes a goal. A goal broken down into steps then becomes that plan. Okay, That plan backed by action, which is often where people fall down, makes your dreams into reality. And it's all about taking hold of the opportunities. The second thing is this here, is that incremental change, small changes are really important. Again, that has come across time and time again. Um, if I sort of decided I was going to climb that wall, I think it would probably be better using the steps um, because it might be quicker if you could actually do it. But most of the time you can't. It's too big. You know, you bite off too much. So what you need to do is say, that's where I want to get to, and here's the individual steps. And some of those steps will fail, um, but, but you, you can work a way around it and keep continuing. And that's really important. So only change a small number of things at a time Measure the change, see that it worked, and then move on, move on, move on, keep it going. Um, third one is the first limiting factor. What is holding your business back? Identify the single biggest thing holding your business back. Identify why it's a problem. Understand the implications. Understand really how you might resolve it and the cost. And then solve the problem. And you know what the really exciting thing is? Then you have another problem to solve um, after that because something else is the first limiting factor, but you've moved the business on. And here's something, if you ask me in my career what's the most important thing that I personally have done, it's just to know people who know. I am pretty hopeless at an awful lot of stuff. I really am. I'm pretty good at other things, but I do know a lot of people who are good at things I'm not. And therefore, if you know where to go to get the answer, that's probably more important than trying to know it yourself, because you can't know everything, and you can't keep up with new developments. So knowing people who will inspire you and push you on is really key. And inspiration takes definitely different forms. But like, no one knows everything. Someone always knows better than you. Be generous. Share your knowledge with somebody else because they'll share something with you as well. Build friendships. It's surprising how, you know, similar to what Chris had said in a lot of this. Do some things for nothing. Help other people and others will help you. Ask for help. It's not a weakness. You know, we've all been the kid at the back in school going, oh, I'm not going to ask that because I look stupid. And then it comes up in the, in, 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 in the exam and it actually proves you're stupid then. Because, <laughs> do, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I've done that. <laughs> The other one is market focus as well. Um, there are lots of markets, but actually don't sort of randomly try to hit them all. Pick one or two that suit your business and go forward to it. What do they want? Um, and if your business, if it's predicting what the consumer wants, and, and sustainability, by the way, is really important, and data flow and good stories about your farm are all things that are going to help us sell product going forward, um, that market focus is really key. So market demand and meeting it, you can, you can work it all down there. And all I'm saying to you is there that I believe farm assurance, I believe data flow from your farm and sharing of data from your farm um, is going to become really, really important to keeping our consumer market in the UK. Not protectionism, but actually just good stories. So ultimately, successful business owners implement change. Okay? If you're not implementing change, um, you're not a successful business owner. If you aren't making mistakes, you're not trying. Simple as that. Okay, and here's a quick quote. Why don't we change? Some people lack knowledge. Some people lack confidence. You know, Northern Ireland again. Um, essentially, if you had three sons, two were clever, one wasn't. Um, you sent the two off to do something useful and you sent the, sent the other one back to farm. That's not the way it works anymore, I'm afraid. Um, you know, anybody can keep an animal alive, but they can't farm properly. Business needs intelligent, trained people taking it forward. And that's really key. And actually, how you see yourself really can limit what you do. And Chris said that, so I don't need to say it. Some people can't see what their business could be. So go to other farms, see what is possible. 
Some people don't measure, and if you don't measure and get feedback, sure, what difference would it make? You've no idea if you've moved forward or not. Some lack accountability. That's why good farmers often tend to be husband and wife teams. Why? Because there's a degree of accountability. I'm not saying which way, um, but you get the idea. I, and time and time again, I've seen that. The husband and wife team involved, or, or tools, it, it really makes a difference. Two minds are much better than one. And lastly, and this is, this is where I offend again, but I don't remember this, I'm leaving for Ireland, I'm all right. Some people are just lazy. There's no such thing as a physically lazy farmer, really. But there are lots of farmers who would rather muck out a calf shed than do the vat. The vat or muck out the calf shed rather than, than collect data. You know, and actually, some of the stuff you don't like doing, employ somebody else to do it. Get a bookkeeper to do it if you don't like doing it. You know, but you must do it. So this sort of lazy, I'll only do what I want to do, it doesn't work anymore. Well, it never did work, actually. But anyway, the other thing is this change is a process. Some don't realize they need to change, um, and then they don't change. And then as you work it through, but change is really, really um, up to you. And it won't happen overnight. It's lots of steps. That's for alcoholics, by the way, but it applies to farmers as well, just to be clear. You know, it's this business of actually preparing for change, taking action, making yourself do it, making yourself do it, making yourself do it, making yourself do it, and then suddenly you just do it. It's about two months to develop a habit um, and, and, and get it. And if you miss out on any of the particular aspects of change, you've got a real problem there. So change needs vision, skills, incentives, resources, and an action plan. If any of those are missing, it's a real problem. And if any of you want that particular slide, you can, you can email me afterwards and I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you, but we'll not go into detail. But you need everything, and if your business doesn't have everything to make those changes, you need to get it from elsewhere. Drive productivity. That's another one. And the common factors in productivity are this, and we're nearly finished. Data gathering. You must have seen that today. Data analysis. You've seen that today. Management according to data. It's not actually rocket scientists, by the way. It's just hard work. Good attention to detail. All the best farmers I know, by a mile, high attention to detail. Farm development plan. They know where they're going. They involve outside expertise because guess what? They don't know everything. You know, and, and again, we're preaching to convert it. You're here because you know you don't know everything. Um, I've had many interviews with quite a few people who, who felt they knew everything based on a survey size of one on their own farm. Um, and it's a problem. Positive farmer attitude. You know, yes, there are challenges, but farming is a great job. The market signals are brilliant. The technology is there to take it forward. And you can do tremendous work on your own farm and turn it into really what is a showcase. That's exciting, but you never stop learning. You're never there. It would be lovely to be there, so it would. It's exhausting sometimes not being there, but you, it's just the way it is. That is business, and that's what we are up against. And then people keep talking about building business resilience. Do you know what building business resilience is? It's making sure you have a good market and making sure your business is up to supplying it as efficiently as possible. Not much more than that, really. Actually making sure your business has enough reserve and is technically good enough to, result, to, you know, to resist challenge. That's all it is. It's, it's nothing particularly more exciting than that. A bad attitude is like a flat tire. You're never going to go anywhere unless you change it. And so lastly, um, as we finish here, you know, there is an exciting future. We are entering exciting times, and I hope you get that. You know, it, it is exciting, and the potential is unbelievable. There are unparalleled opportunities in front of you. There are new challenges. There are big challenges ahead. But actually, our competitor challenges are probably bigger than our own. So if we put in the same amount of effort, we will move further forward. And that's really important. Also, grab the whole robotization and AI. Do it in a small way first, but make sure you are tech aware. Because that is going to be the difference between a good farm and an average farm in the future. Using technology effectively. And I'm just really going to finish there by saying the future is bright. Um, I was trying to think of something smart to say about leaving you with sort of some sort of depression as well. But the truth is, there's challenges ahead. But actually, um, it's exciting. And if you're prepared to take the actions and put the skills in the right place, um, you will be successful. And, and perhaps you'll be up on this stage. You're, you'll be the next generation of, of Lloyd and Daphne here telling how you have taken it forward. Um, but thank you very much. I'll finish there. Thank you.